friends, and welcome to Conversations with Consequences. We are the ladies of the Catholic Association, bringing you witty and charming in-depth conversation on the topics that matter to you with the leading thinkers and movers of our time. Conversations with Consequences is part of the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Our radio show is always a podcast, and you can listen by going to thecatholicassociation.org slash podcasts, or you can just go directly to wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie, and today my TCA colleague, Ashley McGuire, will be joining me for the whole show. At the end of the show, we'll be talking to Roma Downey. She has a new film out, or actually will be out on Good Friday, featuring Dennis Quaid and Heather Graham. It's called On a Wing and a Prayer, and it's based on a true miraculous airplane story that happened on an Easter Sunday. And it has a happy ending, I'll be happy to say, because I don't like airplane stories with bad endings, and I'm, I think a lot of people are with me there. We're going to be talking to Roma Downey, who is the executive producer of the film, and this film will be available on Amazon Prime on April 7, which I think is really good news, because there's so much horrible stuff on those uh, on, on Netflix and Amazon Prime, and and still you want entertainment, right, that you can watch with your whole family and and feel clean after you finish watching it and also hopeful and, and enthused about life and, and the goodness of man and God. But first, at the top of the show, Ashley McGuire, my friend and TCA colleague, and I will be talking about um, the alarming rise in uh, sadness and depression among teens, especially teen girls, something that uh, I th- I'm sure is occupying a lot of, of concerned minds and hearts since uh, those the, the those sad statistics came out. Thanks for joining me, Ashley. Hey, it's always so fun to be with you, Gracie. So much to talk about this week, and unfortunately, all of it is colored by the latest horror in Tennessee, this terrible um, school attack. It seems that we we barely get out of one and we get into another one. But it's it's uh, it's a terrible thing. But it's tied into what we wanted to talk about originally, in some in some strange and dystopian ways, which is we wanted to talk about the the alarming rise in 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 depression and anxiety and suicidal behavior in young people, especially in teenage girls. So this thing that just happened in Tennessee, this terrible school shooting has um has a lot to do with all that it's a it's a young woman um who who did this attack which is a very strange thing because women don't generally shoot up schools or shoot up anything right because because we're women and that's not part of our repertoire we tend to nag people to death instead and um so but so there's something disturbingly wrong out there the statistics are are very sad and very shocking so you've been you've been talking you've been thinking a lot about this and and talking about this Ashley you flagged a very interesting piece on Substack called why the mental health of liberal girls sank first and fastest. We can sort of assume that this poor this this woman who who shot up the school was a liberal girl, right? From her from her uh, manifesto and 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 the things that that are coming to light about her. What happened to liberal girls, Ashley, according to this great article on Substack? Well, the article is by Jonathan Haidt, who I really admire and respect. He's a social sociologist um, who wrote actually an excellent book that I I commend to everybody um, called The Coddling of the American Mind. Yes, fabulous book. Yeah, and he co-authored that with a psychologist and... You know, the thesis of that book relates to the article and relates to, you know, our topic today, which is basically that, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy was this revolution in psychology. And the main kind of crux of CBT, uh, for short, is that you, by gradual exposure to things, you uh, kind of lessen the nature of your reaction to it. So if there's something you're afraid of, something that's giving you anxiety, kind of confronting those fears, those anxieties in small, like baby steps is the way that you learn to cope with and your, you know, response to it and eventually overcome, overcome it so that it's not controlling you. And he basically, along with Greg Lukanoff, argue that what's happening in universities and with youth is 
the reverse, that they're being taught to like shut down anything that upsets them, run from it. Uh, and that can actually magnify the, the fear, the anxiety, the depression, um, and can make it worse and make you feel totally controlled by it. And um, in this article, though, he talks about, uh, he, he breaks out young people by um, sex and by political orientation and found that um, liberal girls or young women um, have just seen this dramatic spike in um, social ills, anxiety and depression um, in the last, well, really uh, accentuated in the last couple of years, but starting over the last decade or so. Um, and he has kind of an interesting theory. I mean, I think at this point, you know, you've written about this. Um, we've all at the TCA team written about um, the effect, the ill effect of social media on young people. But he talks about this sort of culture of victimhood um, and that these girls are especially affected by this idea uh, of telling people that they're victims and victim identity groups. And this is really what identity politics has mm -hmm. become, which mm -hmm. is just, you know, categories of, of victims and, and that girls just seem to be disproportionately affected by it. And he points out that uh, liberal girls are also significantly more likely to spend, you know, they spend the most time on social media, which is where you just get bombarded by these um, these ideas. But anyways, it's Ashley, it's, um, let me let me read let me read to you from his article, the three ideas, sure. the three ideas. So our listeners can follow along. Idea number one, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Number two, always trust your feelings. And number three, life is a battle between good people and evil people. Now, those, that's very interesting, right? When you look about when you look at the liberal and conservative divide, right? So what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. That's that's a very that's a very complicated way of looking at the world, right? Like in in a in a in, in a way that I would teach my children and you teach your children, you'd say every time you face an obstacle, um, and if you face it with bravery and determination, somehow you will grow through that experience, right? You may not be able to defeat the obstacle or climb over it, but even just the experience of that contradiction in your life, there's a lot of growth possibilities there. Would you agree with me? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's sort of, that was sort of the American way up until about, you know, again, like 10 years ago. Okay. Always trust your feelings. That's a, that's also now a very liberal mm -hmm. mantra progressive thing, right? Like your feelings are the most important thing. Like whatever you feel that has to be uh, expressed and people have to, you know, work with that and, and celebrate it. And and you and I, on the other hand, and conservatives would say, you know, your feelings are important, but they're not the most important thing. What's most important is um, your duties and your responsibilities and meeting the world with courage and going out there and doing the right thing. And yeah, your feelings are going to get hurt a lot. But you can't, you know, lock yourself into a little bubble. You've got to go out there and be that person that God made you to be. Correct? Well, right. And think about our faith. I mean, we talk about our faith in terms of faith and reason, not faith and feelings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, faith and know, reason. We, reason really, I mean, we, you know, the head and the heart, they work together. But the head has to absolutely, ultimately prevail over, you know, or, or it, 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 you can't write it out of the of the equation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also in, in our reading, we say, you know, your feelings are important, but they're not in control of you. You can't allow them to control you. You have to make decisions based on your, you know, the virtues and your, and your duties and your responsibilities as a child of God. You have to make decisions and you have to school your feelings and, you know, make your feelings work for you, not be a slave to your feelings, right? No, definitely. And, and it's not just our faith, too. It's, I mean, it's, this is psychology. Like, you know, you, 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 psychology is learning to kind of not to master your feelings and to, um, to listen to them and then to control them, to reroute them. Um, and so, no, absolutely. Okay. And then the third idea, life is a battle between good people and evil people. And I think here we see where a lot of this dangerous thinking is coming from, this very depressive thinking is coming from. Because if you're teaching, and they are teaching this in college, they're now teaching it in elementary school and high school, 
and they teach it all over TikTok and Instagram. If you're thinking that life is divided into camps, right? And then there's this evil camp over there and they're out to get you. And you've got to be so careful. And the world's a dangerous place. And and there's evil people and good people and never the two shall meet. I mean, this is a completely anti-Christian idea, right? I mean, this is not what, what we, how we feel and how we teach our children. We say, that, like Solzhenitsyn said, the line between good and evil doesn't run between, it's not between groups of people, it runs through the human heart. All of us are capable of good and evil. And you go out there and you meet people that don't have the same ideas as you or the same experiences, but inside them there's great good. And you can no, find that. You can find that in, in human interaction and in, and in opening yourself up to the world. Yeah, and I think actually it's very important to know in a personal way and be friends with and interact with people who think very differently from you. Otherwise, yeah, you will bunker down into this sort of trench warfare-like mentality. And, you know, everybody talks about all the polarization and the you know schisms in our country, but it, it begins with thinking that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it begins with thinking that you can't possibly bridge divides, that, the, that those divides are impassable, right? Right. And, and if, you are, if you are being taught that people who think differently from you are evil, um, that is very troubling. Mm-hmm. So in this piece by Jonathan Haidt, which is, abs- is absolutely fascinating, he's, what he's positing is that what the colleges are doing and what even high schools are doing is they're teaching anti-cognitive behavioral therapy to the kids. Right? They're saying they're teaching them to do all those things that therapy teaches you not to do, like think of the world in black and white terms, think of people as automatic enemies, um, think of everything as a catastrophe, right? So something happens, I I don't know, I <laughs> someone's late to meet me for or a cup of coffee, suddenly it's a catastrophe, my day my day is wrecked, right? That's a, that's a terrible way to lead your life, to think of everything as a huge ordeal. And that's what we're seeing on college campuses and what we're seeing in, in all these depressive, these poor depressed kids who are committing suicide at an ordinate or at least attempting at an ordinate rates. Yeah. And he talks about also the idea that um, people who have, he talks about this, um, what he calls the locus of control. Which oh is, yes. That's a great, great concept. And the, and this is related to what we just talked about, because if you feel like, um, you know, if you're trapped into think, if you're thinking those three, you know, pitfall, um, thoughts that we just talked about, then you're going to have a sense of powerlessness mm-hmm. that, you know, every, the things are out of your control, um, which makes you feel like a victim as opposed to if you have an inner locus of control, um, you know, namely that you have a sense of self-responsibility and that you have a sense of agency in the world. Um, you know, he's done all this research um, about the fact that People with a strong sense, inner locus of control, tend to be much happier. Um, and and he talks about the way uh, you know today's youth are being raised in a very sort of external locus of control way. Like the sort of climate alarmism, I think, is a really good example. Um, if you feel like there's this catastrophic thing happening to the planet, and there's like nothing. Any, but you know, you, nothing you can do about it. That's a very kind of alarming way to be raised. In fact, part of why we pulled our daughter out of public school was because starting in kindergarten, she was being taught these things that were scary and upsetting to her. And she was starting to talk all the time about this. And, you know, as we know, as Christians, like we don't just brush aside the question of the environment. And the, the current book has done a very good job, I think, of talking about the integrated ecology and that we do have a responsibility to be stewards of the earth, but we have agency in that. And anyways, I'm getting a little sidetracked, but no, no, no. I, I think, I think this is a fascinating um, side, side issue, right? Control, locus of control. But let me, but let me ask you, catastrophes do happen. The world the world is a catastrophic place, right? I mean, we're, we're sort of living in a golden age, maybe in our little section here of the West. And in these years, we haven't had a major war in a while. Maybe we will next year. <laughs> and um, But bad things happen. I mean, we saw this with, with COVID. I mean, if you're a young person and suddenly your entire 
way of life shuts down and you are sitting in a little apartment um, somewhere with just your screen to keep you company and, and your mom and dad or just your mom are busy on the laptop all day and every all your beautiful human interactions and all your plans and all your routines were disrupted. That's a huge catastrophe. So catastrophes do happen. So where does the where does the this locus of control apply when when it's true that you're living in a world that's out of your control? For us, well, how do we how do we teach our children differently? In your opinion? Well, you know, I think with the pandemic, for example, in the beginning it was very scary for all of us when we didn't know what we didn't know. But then there began to be moments where we had choices, um, you know, choices about whether or not to live in a sense of perpetual fear or to mm-hmm. sort of read the facts and understand, for example, that this was not something that threatened children and that children should be sort of uh, protected from the fear um, and liberated from some of these more draconian policies. So the ginning, um, you know, the ginning and, up of fear was part of somehow was some part of the the liberal psychology, right? Like intensifying this feeling of fear, and 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 our children paid for that. Yeah, and I'm sorry, but I still see it in where I live in the DC area, where it's like people are living like it's April of 2020. Still, and read. Oh yeah, and reading this article was just illuminating because I thought these are people who who have an external locus of control. They they feel like things are happening to them that they don't have control over, and even despite you know all these different actions, they can't. It's like they can't let go of um, the sense that they're a victim. Mm-hmm. <laughs> of, of I'm not even sure they could tell you what because at this point everybody's had the had the virus, um, but but going back to the um, the victim mentality, it, this article is so really captured my attention because the day before I read it, I was out with my ten year old daughter who is very perceptive and she notices all the sort of signs and slogans that are everywhere and asks me about them and um, had seen one that said something about empowering women and then had seen on like M&M candy bags, something about, you know, women's And she asked me, you know, what are all these things about empowering women? And I just sort of reflexively said, look, women are not victims. We're not victims. We have an extraordinary amount of choice and agency in our own lives. And don't let anybody tell you that you're a victim because you're a woman. Well, there you are and back to the locus of control, right? Exactly. And I hadn't even read this article. When I read this article, I thought, I understand actually why it is young liberal women who feel like probably like they're in this hurricane, you know, which would make them feel totally lost and overwhelmed because women today are bombarded with a fire hose of slogans and articles suggesting that they are victims. And I think it's only gotten worse since the fall of Roe v. Wade, this idea that, you know, our rights are being taken from us. We are, you know, oppressed, this, that, or the other thing. And you just keep pummeling women, especially younger girls who really haven't had a lot of life experience or formation. And that's really going to get into your head and make you feel like, oh, and there was a a question that he asked that broke down um, girls by uh, political or or liberal or conservative, something to the effect of, Every, you know, agree or disagree, every time I try to get ahead, somebody stops me. And the liberal girls overwhelmingly answered yes. They were the most likely cohort to agree. And I thought, that's just a really terrible mindset to live your life with. But who can blame them in some respects? Because it's not just social media. It's everywhere. It's every package, every sign. And you know what's so crazy? Women have never had it better. Than today in the United States and in other Western uh, progressive cultures, a woman has so many advantages over a man. If you go to a college campus, there there are more women there than than men. Um, In every medical school, there's more women than men. In every law school, there's more. I mean, it's if you're a man, it's hard to break in. The women have so many more advantages than men in general. I mean, as far as if you're talking about systemic, systemic. preferences right the systemic preference is all for the female <laughs> right and not for the male no it's it's really true and so we are sort of living in a weird feminized anti-masculine world in, in a sense 
And if if, yeah. if if you look at all the different the different ways that that expresses itself, um, and yet, well, so and so who is why are people doing this? Is this this kind of uh, this creation of of catastrophic thinking, victimhood, is that's being pushed on all our uh, on on women and girls? Is it being done um, by people who who know what they're doing and they're creating sort of um, political client groups that will always be with them? Or do you think the people up above who are doing this are just sort of following like a cultural zeitgeist and they don't even know what they're doing? Are they, are they cynical I, and <laughs> are they cynical and know what they're doing? Or is everybody just falling off the cliff together? Yeah, it's such a good question. I, I would say, you know, it's probably a little bit of both. I certainly think that there are people with power who have very bad intentions, who exploit the psychological power of making people feel like victims, making them feel afraid. Um, and that is whether we're talking about three years out from the pandemic or, you know, trying to uh, push forward extremist abortion laws, um, what have you. But then I also think there's a sense of you know, in a post-Christian world, people really are kind of lost. And this makes me think of Mary Everstadt's short book, Primal Screams, where That's she says... such a good book. She talks about, you know, in a world where you have uh, declining religion, breakdown of the family, like human humans deeply need to have a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. And when their church is broken up and their family is broken up, they... They, they will gravitate to somewhere where they feel like they belong. And that has become sort of identity politics. And so, you know, if you see young people sort of flocking to, and I think especially liberal children flocking to identity politics to find a sense of meaning and purpose and belonging. And so it's just creating this sort of perfect storm that we find ourselves in now. I mean, that's my armchair. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, I agree analysis. with you. And we have to... We have to help our children. We have to help them emerge from from that bunker mentality where where they're victims and the world's a, an evil place and catastrophes are going to swallow them up unless unless they defend themselves by joining. Well, anyway, it's a terrible place to live in Florida. So you know, Ashley, and I don't know if my listener of our listeners know uh, that I was I'm on the board of education of the state of Florida, and I've learned so much about education that I thought I knew a lot raising five children <laughs> through several, all the stages of education. But one thing we're doing in Florida that was spearheaded by the first lady, Casey DeSantis, is something called resiliency education. And it's being built into um, elementary and high school. And when I first heard about it, I was a little confused. I wasn't sure. Resiliency didn't mean anything to me when I heard the term. But deepening my my understanding of it and reading up on it, what it really is, it's, it's instilling in young people or trying to instill in young people the virtues, the human virtues that protect them from this kind of thinking that Jonathan Haidt is talking about in his Substack column. Um, all those all those terrible ways of thinking that that leave them completely unprepared to face a complicated world. So for instance, things like um, respect for others, right? And one of those, one very important part of respect is respect for other people's opinions and their and their um, their right to express themselves and be different from you in the way that they think. Another thing is perseverance, right? So understanding how to set a goal and then making, understanding how you can make plans to achieve your goal and how you can have steps to, to get there and how you can fail at some of your steps, but you get up the next morning and you try again. And so all these, a collection of different human virtues that, that will protect them from this kind of thinking. Well, that's really wonderful and is something that we need so much more of. And, you know, I, I also think for, you know, parents who are our listeners who feel kind of overwhelmed by all this, which, you know, I, my kids are a lot younger than your kids. So I haven't, we're just starting to enter the world of, you know, pressures with technology and things like that. But I also think that our faith is such a great antidote to this culture of victimization, because the very starting point is this idea that we are sons and daughters of mm -hmm. God with a, yes. with a purpose purpose and a calling and, you know, endowed with a unique dignity and that we are 
you know, meant to treat others as the same. And it's it's truly the the opposite. Uh, what we're taught in our faith is the opposite of what young people are being taught today, which is that we are powerless victims. Um, the world is evil. <laughs> um and there's nothing you can do about it. It's, it's you know, they're, they're two very different approaches. No, I'm glad you brought us back to that, Ashley, because it's true. If, if we know who we are, if we know we are children of God, and that makes us all brothers and sisters, then, you know, 95% of the problems that we will face, uh, we, can, we, can, we can face with courage and grace, right? Um, and some of them we just have to struggle through because they're overwhelming. <laughs> but... But wow, what a what a what a difference, right? To to know who you are and to and to teach your children who they really are. And and we should wrap up on that. So thank you so much, Ashley, for joining me today. That was that was a really fun um, chat to, uh, on on these very important issues. And let's all pray. Um, you and I and our listeners, we should all be praying for the uh, the, the victims of this of this latest. Horror. My husband just told me that one of one of the children is uh, works for the same company. Is a child of of of, uh, of a co- like a a colleague, a, a distant colleague, because he's in another state. But he's very broken up about it. When you think about a nine year old losing their life in this in this terrible way and how the family must cope, mm-hmm. so all our prayers obviously um, will be praying intensely for their consolation, and the children will go straight to heaven, so they'll be okay. Every morning, the Catholic Association reviews all the latest news and sends our subscribers a carefully curated collection of the most important news of the day. Items are specifically selected for a smart Catholic audience like you. Don't let the world take you by surprise. Subscribe to our daily media roundup at thecatholicassociation.org. Welcome back to Conversations with Consequences. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie, and we are thrilled to have back with us actress, author, and executive producer, Roma Downey. She's going to discuss her new movie that comes out on Good Friday. It's called On a Wing and a Prayer and stars Dennis Quaid and Heather Graham. It tells the harrowing story of hope and prayer, a true story. And we're going to hear more about that from Roma. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to talk to you today. Roma, this is Ashley. Before we get to your very exciting um, new movie that's coming out, I just have to say that I'm such a fangirl and I grew up watching Touched by an Angel every Sunday night. And it was my sisters and I would fight for the best spot on the couch um, to get into position before the next episode aired. Um, so it's it's so exciting to be speaking with you. And, you know, I Gracie and I were thinking and talking about how um, sort of rotten Hollywood has become and how there's just this, I don't know, misperception that um, entertainment has to be tawdry to appeal. And I was thinking of my own experience as a teenage girl, um, loving nothing more than your show, which was um, not just wholesome, but entertaining and uplifting and what is it like to be um, somebody who's still shaping the industry uh, the way that it's um, become? Oh, well, first of all, thank you so much for sharing that lovely memory of you and your sister probably battling over the box of cleaning too. Because <laughs> yes. those episodes always touch the heart. And, uh, and it was lovely to be part of a show that had such an intention, you know, that it really was heartwarming and hopeful and uplifting. And honestly, ever since then, you know, in my whole career, whether as an author, as an actor or as a producer, I've continued to try to um, to tell these kinds of stories. It's what I'm interested in. I believe it's what people are hungry for. And certainly in the um 
in the aftermath of of the horror that we've seen unfold in Nashville this week, I think that we just need these stories of hope for people to remind it that there is also goodness in the world and that we, you know, when we come together collectively, we can, you know, we and we need to come together to try to make a difference. So my experience in, you know, all these years later out here as I'm still doing this, I think that we're seeing a little bit of a revival in this kind of programming. Um, you know, about 10 years ago, my husband and I decided to make a mini series about the Bible for the History Channel. And, uh, and a lot of our friends and colleagues thought we were crazy, saying no one is interested in seeing the Bible on the screen. And when the numbers were counted, once the series had completed its, its run, over 100 million people we're interested in seeing the Bible. So I think there are a hu- there is a huge audience out there for content like this. And certainly when I was putting On a Wing and a Prayer together, uh, what was interesting to me is that it's a film that you can sit down with your sister on the couch and your kids on the couch and your parents on the couch. It is a film that has been made for families to enjoy everywhere from the comfort of their own home, because now with streaming, uh, this movie is going to be on Amazon Prime. Uh, families everywhere will be able to watch it over Easter and beyond. When COVID uh, shut everybody down and everybody was so many people, millions of people across the world were just sitting in front of their TVs looking for entertainment. It it became quite apparent really fast that that most of the entertainment out there isn't wholesome. It's not full of hope. It's not full of it doesn't leave you with a good taste in your mouth when you finish watching it. It leaves you feeling it leaves you feeling besmirched somehow that you that you put yourself through it. And it's so wonderful, Roma, that you've made so, so you made important inroads into that problem with your miniseries, The Bible, and with your other work. And now with this new film, I don't, I've seen the trailer. We saw, Ashley and I both saw the trailer. It was aired at the a National Catholic Prayer Breakfast, and I've since rewatched yes. it. And uh-huh. it's, a, it's, it's, it's a great trailer, isn't it? It's super exciting. It is. It I is. Mean, the movie is extraordinary. The film is extraordinary because it tells this true story. I think it's probably what's so remarkable about it is that you come to the end of the film and you look to the person sitting next to you and go, that is crazy. And mm-hmm. it actually <laughs> happened. Um, you know, and so it's just that it's like speaks to the power of prayer, I think, to the mercy of God. Um, it's a it's a movie that has you sitting on the edge of your seat and you get so invested in this family and the journey and this appalling experience that they're going to go through, that they're on this plane ride from the from the funeral of the of Doug White's brother, Doug White, played in the movie by Dennis Quaid. And uh, and he's riding up front in the cockpit with the pilot, really more of a distraction for him in his grief. And uh, he hears the pilot speak to air traffic control. He's looking out the window. He's looking at all the bells and whistles and all the the uh, buttons in the cockpit. And the next thing he hears air traffic control speaking to the pilot, asking the pilot a question. He turns to the pilot and he says, aren't you supposed to answer that? And the pilot is dead in his chair. <laughs> and it's like you it's like a nightmare. You can't even begin to imagine. Now Doug White finds himself on a plane with no pilot and his wife and children in the back. And that really is the is the drama that plays out through the course of this film. Now you might argue there are no atheists in a foxhole. You know, I myself am a person of faith and I pray just about over everything. I can't think of anything in my life, big or small, that I haven't prayed about first. But you can bet if I was on a plane and the pilot had just died, you know, you'd be screaming out to the Lord to help. And um, in this particular case, um, you know, we're going to follow their journey. Now, I'm not in the plane crash movie business. I'm in the hope movie business. So it's not a spoiler alert because this film really plays out in the drama of what happens to them in the air. But it's a beautiful, moving, touching story. It's an exciting film. It plays out like a thriller up there. Amazing performances from Dennis Quaid, Heather Graham, Jesse Metcalf, beautifully directed by Sean McNamara. And, um, you know, I think you're right, coming out of the COVID period, where we all felt so isolated, where we were all so frightened. Um, You know, a film like this 
uh, coming out at Easter season. The true story, ladies, actually happened on Easter Sunday. So we were grateful to Amazon Prime for giving us this Easter Sunday slot. Um, the movie will stream Good Friday through Easter, and then it will live on Amazon Prime. You know, this is the beauty of this new streaming service. You don't have to leave the house. You don't have to go out to the theater. You know, you can gather on the couch in the comfort of your own home together. Roma, you said there's no atheist in a foxhole. And, you know, we hear so often that with these um, intense moments of crisis, people, you know, who aren't people of faith already find their faith and they find it pretty fast um, and they, you know, find their the connection to the divine. I don't know. Maybe it's a spoiler to tell us um, about the faith of this family on the plane. Yes. Um, and if it is, can you tell us a little bit about how it is that you first encountered this incredible story to begin with? Yes. And I don't think it is a spoiler because I think people can assume, you know, on a wing and a prayer that this there's a family in peril and through the grace of God, somehow they're going to make it through. The excitement and drama of the movie is how they get there. And it really plays out, as I say, like a thriller in the air. The script turned up on my desk. You know, I run a company called Lightworkers. And we are committed to telling stories like this. We are the faith and family division of the MGM studio. So the script ended up on my desk, written by Brian Egiston. And Brian is a wonderful screenwriter who himself had started taking flying lessons. And as part of his sort of flight education, he was encouraged to listen to some audio tapes with real life pilots and air traffic control as a way of kind of learning. And one of the audio tapes that he stumbled across on YouTube was the real life audio tape of Doug White speaking to air traffic control during this emergency. And I don't think he could quite believe what he was listening to. I mean, at one point they're asking him if he's um, flying the plane or if it's on autopilot and he responds he says ma'am it's just me and the good lord flying this plane <laughs> oh my and, and i think that's really uh really when you when you meet doug if you were to meet doug he would tell you you know that it was he thought if i'm gonna die i'm gonna die trying not to die <laughs> and his his but fear was just focused fear meanwhile his wife terry and their daughters in the back were just praying it in you know, they, we have a wonderful sequence where we show them just holding hands, saying the Lord's Prayer. It cuts back and forth to the gathering of the emergency services because air traffic control has called them and said, be prepared, bring extra people. You know, this plane is coming in and it's not going to be pretty. They were expecting a fiery ball when that thing hit the ground. And um, and we have this beautiful sequence where we hear the Our Father cutting back and forth with the emergency services, the firemen, etc., getting dressed to go out to fight this fiery ball, which, you know, thankfully never happened. Doug White, you might imagine if this had happened to you that you would never get on a plane again. Um, he not only got on a plane, he decided that was never going to happen to him again because he was going to learn how to fly the plane. And he learned how to fly the King Air. He now flies it commercially and has flown many missions into Haiti and elsewhere. So I love, too, that his life was spared and that he made a decision to really sort of take that and be very purposeful to, uh, you know, to have a life of service uh, since uh, since his life was spurred. But it is a it's a remarkable story. And Sean McNamara has made us a beautiful film. And uh, and I really think audiences everywhere will be will be excited and touched. I've had the opportunity to show it uh, a few select places leading up to Easter. And uh, yeah, there have been tears and there have been cheers in the screening, um, you know, people have just stood up at the end and with relief. Well, you or me, we may never have the 
we, we never be in this situation. We may never have to land a plane. But I think each of us has something in our lives that we're trying to land, whether you have a health crisis, whether you have a job issue. You know, we all have challenges. And I think that the movie becomes very relatable that uh, that you can draw the parallel to think if he can, if Doug White can bring that plane down, you know, maybe we can manage these challenges in our own life. And that's where I think the movie is inspiring. One thing that I caught from the trailer, and again, no, don't, don't tell us anything that we shouldn't know before we watch the movie, but uh, one thing I caught from the trailer is that this is obviously a loving, to united family. A family, you see in the trailer, the family getting on the plane, and there's you can see the tenderness between them, the respect between the husband and the wife, and they obviously are a family, the kind of family we all aspire to have for ourselves, right? A, a, a family united around God and, and, and always caring deeply for each other. Is that, is that a part of, was that a beautiful part of the story that you wanted to express in the film? It absolutely is. It's a beautiful part of the story and, and, and a, a very acute observation on your part, even just from the trailer. You know, I don't know that they would have gotten through it if they hadn't been so united. You know, they all work together to calm each other, to, you know, to hold each other in this space through this traumatizing event uh, at any moment you know you've often heard it said that panic will kill you quicker than anything I don't know in that situation if I could have remained as calm as they did um, but they they continued to be a, a loving a family and I'm sure it must be you know strange for them to see their lives up on the screen like this reminding them of what they've come through but I know they're grateful to God we take a moment in the film, you know, we hear them cry out to the Lord, but we also hear them thank the Lord, you know, and that's sometimes something we all need to be reminded of. We're quick to ask for something. We're maybe not as quick to say thank you. You know, I can't wait for you guys to to see on a wing and a prayer. It's uh, where, you know, it takes a village to make a movie. Um, so, you know, I'm not just tooting my own horn, but the horn of all the people, the wonderful group who brought their excellence to this to make it the film that it is. And uh, we're all very proud of it and excited to share. You know, we've been working on it a very long time. It's probably been four or five years in the making from my team. Uh, of course, we were held up with COVID in the middle of that, but um, finally we get to to share it and uh, and hopefully it will inspire of families um, all across the country. Indeed, the world is launching globally April 7th. But, um, you know, as we hearken back to you and your sister on the couch, I just, uh, my prayer is that families will gather this Easter on the couch together to see a loving family in in distress and to see how, how prayers from the faithful can be answered so uh, lovingly. Well, we we are almost at the end of our time, Roma, but and yes, and we are very much looking forward to the movie A Wing and a Prayer, which opens, which will start streaming on Good Friday on Amazon Prime. But quickly before we go, I just wanted to point out to our listeners that you have a new book and it's called Be an Angel, Devotions to Inspire and Encourage Love and Light Along the Way. Tell us real fast about your book and and how it can help us, um, how it can help all of us live up to the love that we're supposed to be and the light. Well, you know, I just I think sometimes that kindness is an underrated uh, value. And, uh, you know, I've just always encouraged my children to be kind with each other and, you know, with their friends and their loved ones. And so be an angel is a reminder to be kind. It's a daily devotional. Um, and each chapter ends with a suggestion, a be an angel suggestion that is like a call to action. It's not just, you know, thinking about doing something nice. It's like, what can you do? What's an actual step you could do? And um, I've, it's just came out last month and it's been doing ever so well. And it's, it's a, just a beautiful little reminder that each of us can be like an angel to each other. It's got beautiful scripture and quotes and personal anecdotes from my own life, uh, from my time on Touch by an Angel. Uh, fans on there will see some beautiful stories about my friendship with Della Reese and John Dye, my co-stars, and 
just my life in Ireland and just how how good God has been to me and to give the glory to God for the life that I've led in America. I'm so grateful to America for all the opportunities that I've had here. And um, um, anyway, it's writing is not my day job. Producing is, but I get up very early in the mornings and it was just in my heart to, to share this book. And, um, you know, I'm already hearing from people that, you know, it has been a, you know, they're thinking of gifting it for Easter. They have bought it for their mums already for Mother's Day. And again, it's called Be an Angel. And um, thank you so much for allowing me a moment just to mention it. I hope that it's a blessing to anyone who picks it up. Oh, I'm sure it will be, Roma. And you have been an angel in so many ways uh, to the whole culture. And it's going to be wonderful to watch on a wing and a prayer that opens on Good Friday and uh, will be on Amazon Prime. Thank you for joining us, Roma. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. and. I wish you guys a a great rest of your week. Thank you. Every morning, the Catholic Association reviews all the latest news and sends our subscribers a carefully curated collection of the most important news of the day. Items are specifically selected for a smart Catholic audience like you. Don't let the world take you by surprise. Subscribe to our daily media roundup at thecatholicassociation.org. And now, Father Roger Landry offers us, as is customary, a short and inspiring homily to prepare us for this Sunday's Gospel. This is Father Roger Landry, and it's a privilege to have a chance to ponder with you the consequential conversation Jesus wants to have with us tomorrow on Palm Sunday throughout this upcoming week that the Church calls holy. It's holy first because of all Jesus did during these days, from his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem, to his teaching in the temple, to the Last Supper, to his prayer in Gethsemane, to his arrest, torture, crucifixion, and death on Good Friday, to his rest in the tomb and his glorious resurrection on the third day. It's also called holy because it's supposed to make us holy. If we live this week the right way, if we enter into the mysteries we celebrate, if we internalize all Jesus won for us during these most holy days, and enter into a conversation with him, not just with our words or thoughts, but with our whole life. Holy Week is supposed to be our most faithful week of the year, but that requires our choosing to make it the most faithful week of the year. This week, Holy Week is taking place within the first year of the three-year-plus Eucharistic revival that the bishops of the United States have summoned. So what I'd like to do is look at the consequential conversation the Lord wants to have with us in the Gospels on Palm Sunday with the Holy Eucharist in mind. Since the happenings of Holy Week aren't just events that happened 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, but realities that are actualized in our interactions with the same Lord Jesus present for us in the altar and in the tabernacles. So let's look at five ways that the dialogues Jesus initiated 2,000 years ago are meant to continue today in our conversation with him in the Holy Eucharist. The first interaction we see when the crowds welcomed him on Palm Sunday. The large crowd spread its cloaks on the road together with palm branches. They cried out to Jesus, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's not by coincidence that the church makes those words our own in the heart of the Mass, right before the Eucharistic prayer in the Sanctus, in which we begin with the words Isaiah heard in his heavenly vision, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. And then add what the crowd said as Jesus entered the city. Hosanna means save now or deliver us promptly. We say that to Jesus who comes in the name of God the Father to give us that salvation and deliverance. Every Mass we're called to relive, in other words, the joy of the crowds on Palm Sunday. Jesus enters not the holy city of Jerusalem, but our holy parish church. And then if we're properly disposed, each of us in holy communion. What an incredible gift we have. And doubtless the angels and saints are heralding Jesus' saving, coming into our life with even greater joy than the crowds welcome Jesus into Jerusalem's gates. The second interaction I'd like to highlight is what Jesus says at the beginning of the Passion account. When the disciples asked, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Jesus gave them explicit instructions about how to find the owner of the upper room and what to do to get things ready, saying to the owner, The teacher says, my appointed time draws near. In your house, I shall celebrate the Passover with my disciples. The Eucharist is the fulfillment of that ancient Passover rite of the Jews in Egypt, memorialized each year by them. Jesus is the lamb who takes away, who takes bread and wine and totally changes them into his body and blood. Like the ancient Israelites before the Exodus, we at mass need to consume the lamb. Unlike those with Moses, we will not wipe the blood on our lintels, but drink it for the forgiveness of our sins. 
Just like Jesus' first disciples needed to prepare for the celebration of what became the first Mass, so we need to prepare well for every Mass. The third interaction is when Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. These are the most amazing performative words of all time, changing unleavened bread and wine into God and instructing us to consume him so that we would be able to conform ourselves more and more to him. He was incorporating us into a sacrifice which would culminate the following afternoon on Golgotha. St. Luke reminds us that Jesus says, I have eagerly desired to celebrate this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus wants us to take and eat, take and drink, Therefore, how much it must pain the Lord that in the United States only one out of six Catholics comes to receive him on the Lord's Day and that far fewer will respond to his RSVP to come on Holy Thursday itself for the Last Supper. At the same time, however, how pleased Jesus must be with those who humbly show up to be with him, to receive him with faith in the sacrament of his love and to seek to conform their whole life to him. The fourth interaction is when Jesus takes Peter, James, and John apart with him in the Garden of Gethsemane to pray as his soul became sorrowful to death, not just about what he would have to endure, but about how many would resist receiving the salvation he would win. But Peter, James, and John didn't stay awake. They didn't pray, but rather fell asleep. Jesus came to them three times to find consolation, and all three times found them snoozing. He asked, so you couldn't keep watch with me for an hour. Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test, for the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus similarly wants us to watch and pray with him. That's what we do in a special way in Eucharistic adoration, not only on Holy Thursday after the Mass of the Lord's Supper, but throughout, throughout the year. It matters to Jesus. He comes to us. He tries to wake us up and pray so that through prayer, our flesh may be strengthened. Just like through his prayer in the garden, according to his humanity, he was fortified for his suffering and crucifixion. Throughout this Holy Week, Jesus, out of love, is choosing us to come apart from the crowd to pray with him. Let's go with him, like the three apostles. But let's try to learn from their mistakes how to stay awake and unite our prayer and life to Jesus. The last interaction we'll ponder is what happened on Calvary. Jesus was crucified with long, thick nails through the nerves of his wrist and feet, and over the course of more than three hours, had to push up on his feet just to prevent his lungs from collapsing. He spoke seven times during those hours. St. Matthew, this Sunday, will record one of the things he said, but all are important. He prayed to the Father to forgive us because we didn't know the consequence of our sins. He promised paradise to a thief who repented, a promise that he will give paradise to all who repent. He gave us his mother, he cited Psalm 22, the words of which expressed a sense of abandonment, but finish with a great manifestation of trust in God his Father. He expressed his thirst so that he would be able to finish or consummate what began at the Last Supper, not to mention fulfill his whole mission. And he finished by entrusting his spirit into the Father's hands. These express what Jesus was thinking on Calvary, which through excruciating pain he enunciated because he wanted us to remember so that we might grasp what he was thinking of us and so that we might join his thoughts and prayers to the Father. We enter into those thoughts every Mass. So we pray in reparation for our sins and those of the whole world. So we pray the Mass with Mary. So we bring whatever sorrows and abandonment we experience to God. So we seek to satiate his thirst with ours and receive the fruits of his victory as we commend ourselves all we are and have with him to the Father. So we prepare to enter tomorrow into Holy Week and sing Hosanna, not just in the gospel at the beginning of the liturgy and in the procession chant, but also in the heart of it as we prepare to receive that long-awaited one on our altar. Let us turn with gratitude to our saving Lord and ask him for the grace to choose him always, to take, eat, and drink the gift of himself he gives so that we may be strengthened by him to follow him step by step to Calvary and all the way with him to resurrection. 
God bless you all. Thank you, Father Landry. To hear more from Father Landry, check out his website at catholicpreaching.com. And you can also catch his writings at EWTN's own National Catholic Register. A big thank you to all our listeners for joining us. I hope that this show was helpful. I hope that it gave you more peace and more hope and more joy. And you go with our prayers. 